you know, when you boil everything down in life, you get to the foundation, you'll drill down to the very essence of life, there are finally just two options in terms of how we decide to live. The first option would be something like this. <laughs> Panic, right? Panic. Let's go through life panicking every moment and every day. That's an option. Another option, obviously, would be, in light of our theme today, prayer. Prayer. I think about it that way. As you look at your life, even your life today, you can either panic or you can pray. You can either go through your life always in a panic mode, and panic produces paranoia, or you can go through your life in a prayer mode, and prayer produces peace. Oh, what's better, panic or prayer? Well, Paul answers that question very quickly, doesn't he? Uh, Paul says in a very familiar section in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, uh, that yes, there are just two options. He says, don't be anxious, don't panic, uh, don't live in paranoia about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see that? You can either be anxious, <laughs> panic, paranoia, or you can pray. And look what Paul says. When you pray, when I pray, that results in peace. What kind of peace? A peace, Paul says, that transcends all understanding. Standing. Now, if that's true, if I've just laid out for you uh, this choice between uh, panic and prayer, if that's true, and it is, then we have some urgent questions this morning. Like, how do I pray? <laughs> what do I pray? When do I pray? Where do I pray? Why do I pray? The answers to those questions about prayer are found in the Bible under three words, three marvelous words, three words that would be our pathway to peace, peace that transcends all understanding. What are those three words? You know them, right? Ready? Here we go. The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is why as we kick off our summer ministry season at St. Michael this weekend, we begin a seven-week sermon series on the prayer of all prayers, the prayer of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. And we begin with looking at an outline of this most famous prayer ever. It begins with an introduction, right? Uh, with these very familiar and endearing words, our Father who art in heaven. And then there's part one. Part one is all about God, God's majesty, God's power, God's love and pity. It talks about God's name, hallowed be thy name, God's kingdom, thy kingdom come, God's will, thy will be done. Very lofty ideas, right? Uh, but then part two of the Lord's Prayer gets down to the, the nitty-gritty of our everyday lives, right? The more mundane things that we need every moment of every day. So part two shows us our deep weaknesses and our desperate needs. And what would those be? God's provision, we need that every day. That's why we say, give us this day our daily bread. God's pardon, we certainly need that regularly. God's forgiveness and God's protection. Deliver us from evil. Two parts. God's greatness, God's provision, and pardon and protection. So let's take a look today at the introduction. The introduction. And it comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, where Jesus teaches us, Our Father who art in heaven. How many times, this isn't a fair question, but I'll ask it anyway, how many times do Old Testament believers actually call God Father? 
Uh, you would think my, maybe hundreds of times, right? At least 50 times. How many times in the Old Testament does an Old Testament believer like Abraham, Moses, or David, or Isaiah call God Father? Answer, seven times. Just seven times. Uh, one of those seven would be in our Old Testament reading today from Isaiah chapter 64. Just seven times. In the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many times does Jesus call God Father? Again, not a fair question, but you would think more than seven, right? Actually, over 200 times. Jesus calls God Father. In fact, Jesus' first recorded words when he's 12 years old in Luke 2, chapter 40, or Luke 2, verse 49, Jesus says what to Mary and Joseph? Did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? The first recorded words of Jesus, he mentions Father, his Father in heaven. The last recorded words of Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, verse 49, Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit, Father. Uh, that's the way it goes for Jesus. At the beginning, Father, and as he speaks his last words from the cross, he commits his life to the Father. You see, Jesus, if Jesus came to do anything, he came to show us that God is not an angry tyrant, a God is not out to get us, a God is not some impersonal force or an abstract idea or a philosophical system. No, God is a father. God is our father. When we were baptized, we went from being orphans with absolutely no hope to becoming children with absolutely no fear. Because we now have God as our Father. Now, for some of us, we connect with the idea. This is a positive idea. Father, God is my Father. But for some of us, not so positive. Uh, for some people, just the mention of Father uh, brings feelings of resentment and distrust and anger, and maybe even abuse. You're thinking, if God is like my father, forget it, God. Notice how Jesus begins the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. We want to recalibrate our thinking and our feeling and our doing so we understand we're talking about a perfect Father, our Father in heaven. And as we pray to this Father, we experience less panic and, of course, more peace. So let's reintroduce ourselves to God, our Father in heaven. Here we go. This God is a consistent father. A very consistent. My father growing up, very consistent, a very stable, a could always depend upon him for the most part. But I figured out by the time I was 54 years old, I'm kind of slow on the uptake sometimes, that when my dad used to say, read one of these days, I finally figured out that one of these days was his way of saying none of these days. One of these days we'll do this. Well, it was his way of putting off his little child. <laughs> Uh, we all do that as parents, don't we? Uh, we're all somewhat inconsistent, finally. But this God is a consistent father all the time. When he says one of these days, it will actually come to pass. God does not get up in a bad mood. He doesn't say, today who am I going to zap? No. He's consistent. He's reliable even when we are not. 
This is what James 1 verse 17 delights in about this consistent father. When he says something, you can take it to the bank. James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change. Not moody. (laughs) He's stable, he's unchanging, and he's not like shifting shadows. That's why I want to pray (laughs) to this Father in heaven. I can count on what he says, and what does he say chiefly to us? I saw this just last week. I had a hunch that this was so, but I did a bit of a word study on Paul's letters. You know that Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament, and 12 out of the 13, with the exception of what? First Thessalonians, 12 out of 13 of Paul's letters, he begins with what words about the Father? The Father's consistent gifts toward his children. Grace and peace. Uh, Paul wants us to know at the get-go of 12 of his 13 letters, whatever you know about God, recalibrate because he's this kind of consistent father who gives his children grace and peace. Now, if that doesn't light your fire this morning, you're working with wet wood. (laughs) Wow, wow. Paul understood who God is. Now, for some of you, this past week, you experienced some turbulent earthquakes. How do I know? I'm the pastor here. I I hear about it. I get it. Uh, For some of you, there were some relational earthquakes, or maybe it was an emotional earthquake. Maybe it actually was, for someone, a financial earthquake. And for several dear people in this church, it was a health-related earthquake. And they felt the earth move under their feet. What do you do Uh, when it all breaks loose? You pray. You pray to a consistent Father in heaven who delights in giving good and perfect gifts. And what are those? Grace and peace. As we recalibrate our understanding of God as Father, we also note that God is a close Father. It's a close Father. Some of you grew up with absentee fathers. There are some people in this church who have never known their fathers. He checked out a long time ago. Or maybe if you knew your father, he was still a bit of a no-show. Maybe he was always out with friends. Or he's always on a business trip. Or even when he was there, he was disconnected and aloof and wooden and not really interested in you. He was reading the paper, working on uh, the latest uh, uh, job in the house. So when you think of God as close, that's not in your framework of thinking. So as we recalibrate this God as Father, (laughs) He's close. He may be our Father in heaven, but He's accessible. He's he's here. He's present. He's fully engaged with you. He looks at you right in the eyes and says, tell me everything. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2. Through Christ, we have access. Access to the Father. We have the ticket paid, we get into the presence, we have front row seats, and what does it cost us? Absolutely nothing. We would love to have that kind of access maybe to NBA finals or NHL finals or or the World Series, right? We'd love to get in free and, and get in and have front row seats, but chances are that won't happen. Paul says, through Christ we have access, 
access. Now, is it because we're such charming children, right? We are such obedient sons and daughters, right? No, no, a thousand times no. We have all been like the prodigal son in Luke 15. We have all insisted on our share of the inheritance and squandered it all in wild living, right? In spite of all that, through the blood, the sweat, and the suffering of Jesus, we have access. Access to who? The most powerful person on the planet who makes and moves the stars. He's a close father. He's consistent. He's also competent. Competent. Capable. God can handle anything we bring him. No problem, no difficulty, no pain, no nightmare is too difficult for this God. And that's very good news. Because if God was only consistent and close without being competent, there wouldn't be a lot God could do with all our baggage and stuff. All God could say would be something like this. I feel your pain. Oh, I'm right there with you. I feel your pain, but there isn't really finally anything I can do about it. That's not your father in heaven. He is very, very competent, capable. When my three children were growing up, I was amazed at what they thought I could fix. Our son Jonathan once came to me. G.I. Joe's head had been chewed off by our dog Maverick. And Jonathan said, Dad, please put G.I. Joe's head back on his body. To this very day, in our basement in Fort Wayne, Indiana, G.I. Joe is still headless. Our oldest daughter, Abby, once wanted me to fix her bookshelf. That bookshelf, it's still here. It's with us. (laughs) That bookshelf is still bookless. Our smallest daughter, little Lori Beth, one day she really mangled her chain and her gears on her bike. Dad, please fix my bike. And to this very day, little Lori Beth Lessing is absolutely bikeless. (laughs) My children thought I knew all things, could fix anything, and could afford everything. They thought I was Superman. (laughs) This God, who is your father, can, will, and most certainly does fix everything. He is competent. He's got the energy, the wisdom, the know-how, And the love to take all of our mangled mess and put it back together again. That's what Jesus says. Jesus puts it this way, talking about how competent this Heavenly Father is. After his death and resurrection in the last chapter of Luke's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. The Father has promised to be competent. (laughs) How competent? Jesus tells the people, stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you've been clothed with power from on high. God is a competent Father. He gives his children power. Power. Who is this power? This power is finally the Holy Spirit who comes to the city of Jerusalem in the second chapter of Acts. And of course, many of us know that the Greek word behind the English word power is this word dynamis, right? Of course, we get the word dynamite from dynamis. This competent father places the Holy Spirit inside of us. And Jesus says the Spirit is much like dynamite exploding hopelessness and apathy and bitterness and anger and rage. And yes, this power, this dynamite, this dynamis explodes the dark sting of death. Question. Is God everyone's father? 
Is God the father of all people? It takes a lot more (laughs) to be a father than just creating someone, right? All people are created by this father, but not all people are connected to this father. There are hundreds of millions of children who have been created by a father, (laughs) but they're not connected to their father. It takes more than creating. It takes connection. If you don't get anything, get this today. Your heavenly father wants to do more than just create you. He's done that, no doubt about it. But he longs, he longs. It's in his heart of hearts to finally and fully connect with you. Now, how will he do that? How does the Father finally say, okay, now we're connected? The same Jesus who gives us the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 is the same Jesus in Matthew 27 who is absolutely and fully and completely and totally disconnected to the Father. What does that look like? Something like this. You know the words. Theologians call it the cry of dereliction. Matthew 27, 46, in his native Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? On the dark cross of Good Friday, Jesus is disconnected. So you and I, so you and I, wonder of wonders, we can be connected to God as our Father. So abandon all of your pride and your pretense and your posing and your pretending and cast yourself upon Jesus. And then what? Once connected, reconnected to the Father through Jesus, this Father knows you intimately, loves you completely, accepts you unconditionally. This Father saw you being created in your mother's womb. This Father saw you being born. He saw your first day of kindergarten, your last day of high school. He has seen every tear. He's seen every achievement, every success, every failure, every regret, and this God as your Father has heard every silent scream. He knows you. (laughs) He knows all about the good and the bad and the ugly. And he still loves you. When those three little lessings were little lessings, (laughs) would they come up to me and say something like this? Hail, thou sovereign monarch of the Lessing clan. I don't think so. Uh, Would they say something like this? O thou who dost so omnipotently dispense our humble allowances. Now what did they call me? Father. (laughs) Father. I invite you to call your God. Father, Father, because as we now can confirm, there are only finally two ways to go through life, panic, (laughs) and that produces paranoia, or prayer, prayer. Prayer produces peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that connects us, reconnects us to our Father in heaven who is so absolutely consistent and close and competent for us, for us, (laughs) forevermore. Let's stand, shall we, church, and sing about just that.